Well, hey there, Tim Warner here, and I want to introduce you or reintroduce you if you've used the service before to the Azure OpenAI service and why you would care. As you can see, I'm in the Azure portal here and I will type OpenAI and I have the Azure AI services blade focusing on Azure OpenAI. Of course, the first question that you may have is, Tim, I searched here in the Azure portal and I don't see the service. As you can expect, or as you would expect, I guess you should say that there's lots and lots of demand for this service. So over here in the Azure OpenAI service docs, which I give you a link to in the video description, you can see right after Microsoft's responsible AI declaration, how do I get access to Azure OpenAI? You need to get on a waiting list. This is just part of Gen AI in 2024. So once you've been greenlit for the service, you can create one or more OpenAI service instances, which as you can see are regional and they suffer. They don't suffer. That wasn't a Freudian slip, by the way, either. They allow you, I should say, let me click create, to put your service, well, I'm going to have to at least start this deployment by specifying a region, a name, and a pricing tier. I will say parenthetically, we always need to remember that when you're using a vendor's Gen AI, you're subject to their terms of service. So for Microsoft, that's using their moderation API or being subject to it in the open AI code of conduct and all that. That's very well worth reading. But if I go next here, let's see. Oh, it has to be a, a globally unique domain name. Let's see. How about that? That should be globally unique. Okay. We'll go next. This is what I wanted to show you here. The fact that Azure OpenAI allows us to put your service on a private endpoint and access it entirely through private non-internet routable IP addresses. Let me know in the comments if you'd like a lesson on configuring private link for Azure OpenAI. I'd absolutely love to show you that and especially showcase it in a hybrid cloud scenario. That's a really big deal. I can't stress that. I don't know of another big service, a big Gen AI service that allows that level of access. I mean, just first of all, look where Azure OpenAI sits. It's in great company. We see all of the cognitive services, which are very mature APIs indeed. We've got the Azure Bot service, all of these Azure AI services, in other words. Speaking of which, we've got some portals to deal with. Let's take a look at our Azure OpenAI instance. And let me, first of all, look up here next to search, this expand all headers. This really was a level up for me when I saw this because at first, when all of these little sections are closed, I'm befuddled. But now I can see again. I would advise against using these API keys. This is the same fundamental issue as Azure Storage or frankly, any REST API. If somebody's got your endpoint URI and one of your keys, you're done for. So the standard guidance applies, regenerating on a schedule, storing the keys and working with them out of Azure Key Vault rather than in here. Your at rest data encryption, including support for customer managed keys. That's a, this is big deal stuff. Sound like a salesperson. I'm really not. I am a semi-official Microsoft evangelist based on my membership to the MVP board program and so on. About the browser situation, uh, let's see what's going on in our service. Right now we just have, as of this recording, I'm recording this on Jul Saturday, July 6th, 2024. It wants to click us out into Azure OpenAI Studio, which is at oai.azure.com. Right, this I guess, we can call now their V1 portal experience. The V2 experience is here, this Azure AI Studio. Now don't get me started about branding and product names. I'm gonna stay in this demo here in the Azure Open AI Studio, but I would encourage you to look at the Azure AI Studio at your convenience. Now this banner here is important. The fact that we can access our own GPTs using the latest and greatest model from OpenAI, GPT-4 Omni. And this is good news. I want to call this out because historically I've told my students and consulting clients to expect a fairly significant gap or delay 
in between when OpenAI implements a new model or a new feature, a change to their API, and then for that to bubble up over here. Because we have to remember that Microsoft and OpenAI are completely independent companies. So um, without overteaching at the moment, what we've got in this Azure OpenAI Studio, we can first of all peruse the off-the-shelf GPTs, and notice we've got DALI for image generation. We've got several GPT-3.5 turbos, several GPT-4s, including, again, Omni, which has a really long context length. I don't remember what it is offhand. So the idea is that you deploy a base model or you can walk down the path of fine tuning a base. And then these deployments become attached to your application. So in this case, I have a deployment that uses GPT-3.5 Turbo. And I can use the playground environment to send in requests, for instance, to the chat endpoint. This is a pretty useful development experience, actually, particularly with prompt engineering. Let's see how this is set up. Sometimes the UI gets on my nerves. It's very resolution dependent, as you can see. There's normally an option to add system messages and so forth. Maybe that's under chat capabilities or not. We can always see the underlying JSON of the conversation among the different identities, the system role, the user role, and the assistant role. Is that right? System, user, and assistant. I think those are the three ones. And then, we, of course, we can modify the properties. While we're over here, we can go to data files. This is where you can securely store your fine-tuning data sets in Azure Storage, which, again, we could talk about in terms of customer-managed keys and high availability. And, of course, there's the authentication question. Earlier, I mentioned not to use API keys. So we're going to be using Entra ID and we're going to take advantage of role-based access control. Okay, awesome. So that is that. Let me see if I can jump all the way back into the Azure portal, because I wanted to pick up or really end on that subject of RBAC. Let me go back to my service instance. We'll go to access control IAM. Let's go over to roles. Let me make sure I'm looking only at built-ins. And let's see if OpenAI is mentioned in this list at all if I filter it. And let's see what's going on. I'll try to stretch out the columns to make them easier to, to work with. Let's see here. Cognitive Services OpenAI Contributor. Cog Services OpenAI AI User. So Contributor is full access, including the ability to fine-tune. So it looks like this built-in role is a great starting point for your OpenAI model managers. And then we have a built-in called Cognitive Services OpenAI User, where you can't make changes, you can read, can you send inference requests? They can inference and create images. So it sounds like the OpenAI user may be a developer where they need to look at model and deployment metadata, but they can't create or edit or delete. And they also, they will importantly be able to send requests, inference requests in the playground or in their own client environment and create images. Now, remember also that you can create custom roles that combine or add other permissions from the uh, spec, from the Azure Resource Manager API tree. All righty then. Well, there you have it with a say hello to Azure OpenAI service. End of the day elevator pitches. If you like what OpenAI has to offer with ChatGPT and or you've used GitHub Copilot and you like GPT there and or you're using Microsoft Copilot, this Azure OpenAI is where you can control end to end the GPTs that your business and your customers and your stakeholders use. Dependency, of course, you're going to need to be an Azure subscriber, and also you're going to need to get on the waiting list and get approved. Thanks a lot. I hope that you enjoyed this lesson. I'll see you next time.